In this video, we'll use Grok to create our own version of Jarvis from the ground up. Who am I speaking with? You are speaking with Jarvis, sir. What is your purpose? My purpose is to teach developers about large language models. For this, we'll make a web app that records your voice. This recording is then turned into text and sent to Grok, which processes the data super fast and sends back the results. We then turn these results into speech. What is Grok? It's similar to GPT, but with an incredibly faster processing capability. Here in this example, you see Grok is done with a 500 word poem before GPT even starts. Why is Grok so fast? Comparing CPUs, GPUs, and Grok's chips is like comparing a skilled worker, a big team, and a precise military operation. Think of a CPU like a very smart and flexible employee. It can go many places and do many things, but it can only do one thing at a time with each part of its brain or core. Even a strong CPU like the Intel i9, which has 24 brains, can only do 24 things at the same time. Let's explore the big team idea using the RTX 4080 graphics card as an example. This card has over 9,000 CUDA cores. Historically, its primary function was limited to gaming and graphics rendering. Watch how Mythbusters explain the difference right, between I'm CPUs and GPUs. Leonardo. And he is going to paint a picture for you guys in the way that a CPU might do it, as a series of discrete actions performed sequentially, one after the other. In three, two, one. Uh, let me speed it up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Leonardo 2.0. When we hit this trigger on this thing, 2,100 gallons of air goes through these accumulators, out these valves, into all 1,100 of these tubes, into these tubes in which the bottom of is a paintball. Each of those paintballs will fly across seven feet of space and in 80 milliseconds reach its target. Hopefully, when it's all said and done, it's going to paint the Mona Lisa. <laughs> GPU painting demonstration yep. in 10, 9, nine eight, 8, 7, 6, 6 5, 4, 4 3, <laughs> 2, 1. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, science class is now over. Thank you. With the emergence of large language models, LLMs, a new use case has surfaced. For example, if you want to use the Llama 2 model that has 70 billion details, it's smart to start with at least two RTX 4080 graphics cards. There are services like RunPod, where you can rent GPU instances for large language models easily, with prices around 50 cents per hour. You might wonder, even with strong graphics cards easy to find, why we would still need a technology like Grok. GPUs are indeed powerful, designed to manage many tasks in parallel. However, when it comes to large language models, or LLMs, the way they process information is sequential. This is where GPUs encounter challenges. While they excel at parallel tasks, such as rendering multiple pixels in a game independently, they're not optimized for the sequential and interconnected workload of LLMs. LPUs are made just for large language models. They have one simple setup and focus on one thing at a time. This means they work together well, sharing memory for fast and accurate language tasks with no delay. Enough theory, let's start building Jarvis with Grok. To start, We'll go to the DeepGram homepage where you can sign up or log in easily with a Gmail address or by creating a free account. Once signed up, you'll receive credits worth $200. Next, I'll navigate to the documentation, specifically to the Getting Started guide under the Text to Speech section. Here, you'll find a sample Python code snippet for converting text to speech using the DeepGram SDK. Now we create a new file text to speech and paste the code. To simplify, we'll input the API key directly in the console, eliminating the need for the .env library. We'll change the name of the main function to text to speech and modify it to accept a text parameter. 
This method will now use the provided text parameter for speech conversion and return the name of the generated sound file. We call our new method with the sentence, this is a test. But before we can test it, we have to set up our environment. First, we create a virtual environment to manage our dependencies separately. Then, install the DeepGram SDK. Next, we'll fetch the DeepGram API key from the website. We give it a name and set the permission. We copy it and store it as an environment variable. Now, everything should be set up correctly and we can test it by running the Python script. You'll see a new file has been created. Let's listen to it. Sure, here's a response. Great, it works. Now moving on to speech to text. For this, we create a new file named speech to text. We go back to the DeepGram documentation and find the Python code for transcribing a local sound file. Let's copy and paste this code. Next, we remove any parts related to .nv. We'll use a pizza ordering sound file from a previous video, moving it to the same directory as the script for ease of access. Can I have a pizza fungi with mushrooms? Let's clean up the code by removing comments and adjusting the script to return a specific part of the response that contains only the transcript, omitting unnecessary details like probability. Rename the method to speech to text, allowing it to accept an audio file parameter for transcription. We remove the hard coded file path. Now let's test it with our pizza sound file. No errors is a good sign, but let's print the result to see the transcription. Perfect, the transcription is both fast and accurate. Now that we can hear and speak, let's start working on our web app. For this, we create a new file named app.py. We begin by importing the necessary Flask functionalities that we need for our web server. We also need to install Flask. Let's import temp file for creating temporary files. We also need access to our text-to-speech and speech-to-text methods. Then we can start initializing a Flask app. We define a root root that delivers an index page. For this, we use Flask's render template method. and we start the server in debug mode on port 8080. Flask expects the HTML files to be in a folder called templates. Therefore, we create it and create an empty index file inside. We paste the prepared code for the index page. Let's quickly go over the code. We have a recording indicator, which is essentially just a red dot displayed when something is being recorded. Below, we have our start button that initiates the recording. And we have a stop button that ends the recording and triggers the transfer of the recorded audio data to our Flask server. At the bottom, you see the import tag for our JavaScript. Let's continue creating this. For this purpose, we create a new folder called static and a subfolder inside it called JS. In the script file, we paste the prepared JavaScript code. First, the code selects and assigns the buttons and the loading indicator to corresponding variables. Upon stopping the recording, the code combines the audio segments into a blob, sends it to the server, and depending on the server's reply, it could play back the received audio. Clicking the Start button initiates recording, swaps the visibility of Start and Stop buttons, and shows a recording indicator. Clicking the stop button stops recording, reverses button visibility, and hides the indicator. Now, we can already start the server and see how our index page looks. 
You'll notice it's very simple, just a black button with a microphone icon. Now we need to make an endpoint that receives sound data, converts it to text, possibly translates it, and then turns it back into speech. We create a process audio endpoint that accepts post requests. We get the audio data directly from the request data. Then we create a temporary file and use our speech to text method to convert it into text. For the time being, we convert the text directly back to speech. Then we return the created audio file to the front end. Let's try it out. This is a test. This is a test. Perfect. Everything works as expected. This solution could already be used to modify your voice or eliminate accents. Our final step is to leverage the power of Grok to do something sensible like translation or answering questions between these transcription steps. And we visit grok.com. Here too, we can simply log in by using our Gmail account. Let's click on the link to Grok Cloud so that we can try out Grok and get direct Python code examples. Let's say hi to Grok, and you can see already how incredibly fast Grok is. Let's try something else and ask Grok to write a poem about LLMs. Again, the result is produced in milliseconds. We can also switch to another language model like the Mighty Llama 2 with 70 billion params. When we click on the View Code button, we can directly see the Python code to reproduce the request. Let's copy this. And we paste it into our Grok service PI file. Also for Grok, we need an API key. We can simply create one by clicking on API keys in the menu. Then we create a new one. We copy the newly created API key. After installing Grok with pip, we can set the key as environment variable. Let's try it out. And it works like a charm. Let's wrap everything inside an execute function. This function should accept a prompt as a parameter. We don't need to set other messages than our prompt for now. We'll use the provided prompt directly as the message content. We have to collect the chunks and return them as one string. Let's give it a try with the prompt. Tell me a joke. No errors, that's good, but we should print out the result. OK, it works. Now we can use it in our endpoint. First, we have to import it. Now we can use it and create a prompt based on the transcription. Let's start with something simple, like translating our text to German. Let's keep our fingers crossed and test it. This is a test. Das ist ein Test. As a native German speaker, I can confirm the translation is accurate. Now, let's modify the prompt to make our app function like an improved version of Siri or Alexa. To achieve this, we simply need to adjust the prompt so it responds to any question asked by web app users utilizing its vast knowledge from 70 billion parameters. Which is heavier one kilo of iron or one kilo of cotton? Both one kilogram of iron and one kilogram of cotton weigh the same amount, one kilogram. This is because the term a kilogram defines a unit of mass, and mass is a measure of the amount of matter in an object regardless of its density or volume. If you've learned something new, check out our other videos on our channel and visit our website at aifordevs.com.